Well, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing this fine evening? Man, awesome. 
We're so excited. We got Brother Jerry Savelle with us this evening. Hey! And Brother Joe, of course, and Brother Eric. We are so blessed to have you three here, all the way from Texas. So if you're wondering what the accent is, it's, they crossed Canada this past week, so they picked up a couple accents along the way. But, man, we are so blessed and thankful to have them here with us. If you, we all stand up together, we're going to just worship the Lord and begin off that way. Aren't you so thankful for Jesus? Man, we love Jesus. We're so thankful for the price he paid to give us the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. So, Holy Father, we just come to you in the mighty name of Jesus this evening with great expectation, knowing that you are good. You are watching over your word to perform it in our lives. So, Father, we just come. We invite you and we say thank you in advance for all that you're going to be doing in our lives through this room. Lord, we give you the glory. We give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
are the word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. There's so much power in the word of God. <laughs> Everything we need is found there, eh? Baby 
take a couple of minutes to just call on the name of Jesus tonight. Father, we're calling on your name. Oh, we're calling on the name of Jesus. Oh, the only one who saves. Oh, Jesus, we're calling on your name for our family tonight, oh God. Father, we thank you, Jesus, and there are kids coming home. Shout Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Yeah. And Jesus for my family, I speak the whole. church we just lift our hands to you king jesus we worship you and magnify you oh we so thankful that there's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved so we call on that name today jesus come on church you just boldly say that name today jesus is that that name every knee will bow every tongue confess that jesus is lord oh we bless you jesus we magnify you no one like you in all the earth no one beside you Oh, how we call and we love that name. How we love you, Jesus. Oh, we're so thankful to you, Master. We're so thankful to you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. I will bless his holy name. Come on, we know that. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Come on, church, we don't forget any of his benefits that he purchased for us. What is it? Every sin has been canceled. Every disease has been healed. He's crowned us with loving mercy and kindness. Woo! My life has been redeemed from the pit. Church, we ain't going to hell. Woo! <laughs> and then he gave us his name. That beautiful, wonderful name. Can we just sing that last part one more time? Just We want to shout it just for a moment. We can just sing that part one more time and just shout it from the mountain. Shout it. Shout it over those circumstances. Shout it. I remember hearing, uh, this is a, a, a gentleman, uh, Mark Hankins, he says, for some of those tough stains, you got to shout them out. And uh, <laughs> so sometimes it's good just to tell your circumstances how it's going to end up. And what we say is what the Word of God has to say is already a done deal on our behalf. So we just come with an expectation this evening. Amen. Come on, let's just shout that. You guys sing that one more time.
We thank you, Lord. We're so thankful, Jesus, for everything you've done. So, Father, we come this evening with great expectation in our hearts. How many of you are expecting this evening? And I was reading in Matthew, you know, just the Jesus uh, said, be, according to your faith, be it unto you. I don't know about you, but if you got some questions or if there's things that are just lingering, if you need a healing in your body, well, today is your day. Don't leave this place without receiving what you came to get. We have King Jesus in the room, and we're just so thankful for him. So why don't you go ahead and you can slap your neighbor, and then you may be seated. Let them know it's good to see them, and you can... Well, good evening again, everyone. So glad that you're here. And, uh, and we got some out-of-towners that are around in the house. We just want to quickly welcome you. If you're out of town, can you just shoot your hand up real quick? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, hello, hello. So glad that you're here. Hey, Sylvan Lake. Yeah, out of town. It's a suburb of Red Deer. That's what that is. But also, there's a few pastors that are also, I want to just make mention, if, and I didn't get to see everyone, but I see pastors Trevor and Jenny from Calgary Word of Faith. We're so glad to see you. Welcome, you guys. Pastor Binyam, there you are from Edmonton, sir. Hello, hello. Uh, I just want to make sure, is, is, is Pastor Lloyd here? Lloyd Hootmer, are you here, Pastor Lloyd? Kyle is. Kyle, where are you at? There you are, Pastor Kyle Hoomer. Would you just stand up there? I want to make sure that I see you probably. Hey, there you are, Kyle, from Rocky Mountain House. We're so glad that you're here. Is there anybody else a pastor here? Don't just throw your hand up because close enough. Okay, all right. Awesome. Well, we're so glad and thrilled that you're here. Those that are online joining us, we're so glad that you came to be with us online as well. We're going to have a great evening tonight, and we're super excited. And uh, before we get started, I want to give it over to Brother Eric. He's a handsome man. And uh, full of muscle, and we just wanted to give him an opportunity to show, or just ease it down a little bit. Well, we're trying to keep him humble. It's a full-time job to keep him humble. So he wears shirts size schmedium, <clears throat> small medium to make him look stronger than he is. So, Mr. Schmedium, would you like to come up here, sir? We're glad to have you. <laughs> wow, I've never had an introduction like that. How's everybody doing? Well, greetings from Texas. We say howdy, y'all. <laughs> well, we started, uh, we came last Sunday, and we started in Sudbury, Ontario, and for two nights there. Then we flew to Winnipeg, and we were in a little town called Winkler for two nights. Then we flew to Edmonton, we were there for two nights. And then uh, yesterday, we were in Calgary, and then today, here in Red Deer, And I believe God saved the best for last. <laughs> We're expecting tonight. Are you expecting? We're expecting. All right, so we have a resource table back here in the, in the uh, lobby here in the foyer. And this was, if you don't, if you've never, if you've never heard Dr. Savell uh, speak, raise your hand. Okay, many of you. So this is what he's known for all over the world. This is what God told him he would be known for, the favor of God. And if you don't know what the favor of God is, I'll give you a couple things here. It's supernatural increase and promotion. It's recognition of everything, that, or it's a restoration of everything the enemy has stolen. It's honor in the midst of your adversaries. It's, uh, it's promotion ahead of others that may be even more qualified. And I like this one, it's preferential treatment. We were in a town, Birmingham, Alabama, in the deep south, and at a church, and he's been going to this church for a lot of years. He goes to this men's store. He's one of the best-dressed preachers in the world, and he sets the bar high. And so uh, I try to, if I can find a deal on a suit, I'll grab it. And so in this men's store, it's, a, it's an upper-end men's store, and I walk to the sale rack, and I, it was 50% off, and there's a brand that's Italian called Canali. And Canali suits range anywhere from uh, $2,500 to $3,000. But this suit was on the sale rack, and it was in my size, 50% off. It was $1,250. So I went over to the mirror, and I tried it on, 
And it didn't, it didn't quit fit me exactly right. It wasn't the medium fit that I like. And so I, you know, I put it back. I, I think about it. And so he picks a couple things out right away, and he's at the counter. And, and uh, so he asked me, did you see anything you liked? I said, well, yeah, it didn't quite fit right, you know. So, well, the, we went to church that night. The church gave him a gift card to that same men's store, and he didn't know he was going to get that. That was favor. So we, he said the next day, hey, I got this gift card, so let's go back to the men's store if we spend this. So guess where I headed? Straight for that rack because I thought, Maybe it'd have fit differently today. <laughs> and so I looked at the sticker on the tag again, and it had been marked down again from $1,250 to $400. That's the favor of God. <laughs> See, when you hang out with Dr. Favor, as he's known all over the world, it just gets on you. It's called increase by association. And when you get the resources and things, you're able to walk with him, even though you're not walking with him personally, but you can uh, experience those same things on your life. So I said, that's the favor of God. So I took it to the counter. The man said, uh, $400 for a canali? He said, I've never seen that. And then uh, we got back to the church. I told the pastor, I, I got this canali suit for $400. And um, anyway, well, when I went to try it on at the mirror, it fit perfectly that day. <laughs> Perfectly. So the pastor said, the pastor says, I know the owner, Mr. Shia. He said, he, I've never gotten a deal like that. And we said, that's the favor of God, you know. And that's what favor will do. Like, like for example, I started out when I learned about favor, believing for parking spots. That's how you can start out. And so when that person pulls out of that front row parking spot at Walmart at Christmas time, when everyone's so cheerful, you can say, that's not luck, that's not coincidence, that's the favor of God. And so what we've done is we come to recognize favor every day in our life, and we declare, Lord, where are you going to show us your favor today? Where are you going to show, another word for favor is goodness. Where am I going to see your goodness today, Lord? And you'll begin to see things that God is doing in your life. When everybody else is looking at all the bad things, you'll be seeing the good things that God is doing because he's still doing good things because he's a good God. Amen? So a couple other things. These are CD series. This one's called Breaking Barriers. This one talks about when a barrier is broken. When you break through a barrier, it creates momentum. And it creates a passageway for others to walk through, like Dr. Savell is the only Savell that's traveled all over the world. And he broke a barrier coming from uh, growing up in Mississippi in a, in a really a poor community. And God has done great things through him all over the world. And he broke a barrier as Savell so that others could walk through those things. And even for guys like me, when I go to Africa, Like mud huts. Witch doctors will be outside the mud huts, like chanting and throwing lizards in his bed. When I go, I stay at nice hotels, and I don't have to worry about that. Well, he broke a barrier in Africa for guys like me to follow behind him and, and to be able to preach the gospel with a little more comfort. Amen? So that's, that's one that you can pick up. There's a man named Rodney Howard Brown heard of him. He's out of Tampa, Florida. He's from South Africa. In 1981, he heard a message that Dr. Savell did called Sowing and Famine. And it's in this little mini book, and we have several of these. But he talked about how Isaac sowed in famine, and in the same year, reaped hundredfold. Well, he and his wife, Adonica, sowed, S-O-W-E-D, sowed $200. That message Got, is what got him to America. And he's now, you know, what he considers missionary of America. So it was because of that. So check that out. Thank you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> this one's called Making Room for the New. This talks about how God wants to do a new thing in your life. He says, shall you not know it? But in order for him to do a new thing, you have to make room for it. When my wife and I moved to Texas in 2019, I came home one day. We knew God was stirring us about something. I came home one day, and our whole bedroom was packed in boxes. I'm like, we're doing this. What are you doing? Making room for the new. 
because we knew what God was about to do. We didn't know what, but we knew that God was leading us somewhere. And it wasn't long after that we end up in Crowley, Texas, at Jerry Savelle Ministries, never having had a conversation with Jerry Savelle. But in, in six months, we were traveling the world with Dr. Savelle and Brother Joe McCroskey. And that's what God will do when he begins to speak to you in your life. He wants to do a new thing in your life. And so there's some things in order for him to do the new thing that we have to make room for him. Man, it's going to be an awesome night tonight. I'm, I'm excited. I feel the presence of God right now. So are you all expecting tonight? Are you ready for the word? Amen. Okay. All right, without further ado, I am not Dr. Jerry Savelle, just in case you were wondering on that handoff. No, I have just the privilege of introducing, you know, the first time that I met Dr. Savelle was actually in this building in 2006. And so it is just such a privilege and an honor to have you here when we actually own the building. And here you are in this place. So can we all give some honor this evening? We receive you, sir, as a prophet of God. We are so thrilled that you're here. We want to welcome. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Well, what a great crowd. Everybody looks good, doing well, had a wonderful day today. If you didn't, it's not over, and there's still time for God to do something special in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Joel, for inviting us to come. And uh, what were you, about four years old last time I saw you? <laughs> but, but age of your son there. And, of course, Papa over here. And uh, what a great time we've had in Canada. And, uh, of course, we're looking, home, looking forward to being home uh, tomorrow, my great granddaughter texts me, or did, what do you call it, uh, FaceTime me today. And she was, when I turned it on, it was her face. She said, Papa, when are you coming back to Texas? I said, I'll be home tomorrow. I got one more service. And I said, I'll be home Tuesday. I got one more service today, and then I'll be home. She said, Wow, dude. <laughs> So I'm looking forward to being home with my family, and it's always great to travel and, and see the light come on in people all over the world. The entrance of, a, of the Word brings light. Amen. Yeah. All right. Do you have your Bibles with you tonight? Okay. One person over here has a Bible. Do you have your Bibles with you tonight? Okay. I can't imagine going to church without a Bible. I want you to open them, first of all to Psalm 5, Psalm 5, and as you're turning there, let me share this with you. In 1991, while I was preaching with Kenneth Copeland in the Southwest Believers Convention in Fort Worth, uh, on Thursday night, after he introduced me to the, to the audience there, we had about 10,000 people in the service, and uh, he was about to walk off the platform. He stopped and said, wait a minute, Jerry, before you get started tonight, the word of the Lord's come to me. He said, uh, God is about to move you into a new dimension of ministry. And it has to do with the office of the seer, which is part of the prophetic ministry. He said, and God is going to begin to show you things to come and then hold you responsible for sharing them with the body of Christ, wherever he might send you around the world. And he said a number of other things, but that was the main part of it. And then shortly after that, uh, I was out in uh, Los Angeles area, preaching all over Southern California. And I had one night off of Saturday night, and I knew that Kenneth Hagan was going to be in Riverside, California. So I'd made my plans to be in his service. And of course, I, I was in L.A., and I've spent a lot of my years in the ministry in California, so I'm very familiar with the territory. I know how long it takes to drive from L.A. to Riverside. I don't like being late, so I had planned to leave early enough to get there and possibly say hello to Brother Hagen before he went out to speak. I didn't let him know I was coming, and I didn't contact any of his staff to let them know I was coming. I just wanted to show up. I just knew I needed to be in that meeting. And as it turned out, the traffic was even more horrendous than normal. And um, I wound up getting to the service an hour late. And I thought, surely 
Brother Hagen would already be preaching, but much to my surprise, when I walked in the back of the building, he was sitting on the platform looking down at his Bible. So I didn't want to disturb anybody, so I just went across the back row, tried to find a seat. And apparently, uh, while I'm looking for a seat, he raised his head up and saw me, and the, the praise and worship team were still singing. And he stood up and he said, you can stop now. He's here. Brother Jerry, God told me you'd be here. I have a word for you. Come on up. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I walked up to the platform and he began to prophesy over me. And he said very similar words to those that Kenneth Copeland said. And he said, uh, uh, God's taking you into a new ministry. And he said, you've already been, he's already spoken to you about it. And he said, uh, God told me to ask you this. What are you going to do about it? He said, you've been a little bit hesitant. He said, God told me to tell you, it's time for you to move in, move up and move out. Okay. And then he said a few other things. And then uh, uh, he went ahead and preached. After the service, I got to spend some time with him back in the speaker's room. And he said, now, Brother Jerry, let me tell you what I saw in the spirit. He said, this has to do with the prophetic ministry. And he said, now, what are you going to do about it? You going to still kind of be hesitant? I said, no, sir. I plan to move in, move up, move out. Because that's what he told me I needed to do. Okay. So those were two of my mentors who saw and heard the same thing. And then uh, I came home and about a month later, I was back out in Southern California and uh, on uh, early one morning, I get a call from Oral Roberts. And Brother Roberts said, uh, Jerry, are you going to be preaching tonight? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, is Carolyn with you, my wife? He said, I said, yes, she is. He said, well, tell her to save two seats. Uh, Evelyn and I will be in your service tonight, and we're looking forward to hearing you preach. I said, can you get there a little bit early so I can say hello to you before I go out? He said, we'll do our best. Well, they did make it a little early. I just had my opportunity to just really greet them and hug them and thank them for coming. Then the usher took them out to sit next to my wife. After the service, Brother Roberts said to me, he said, I'm not going to tell you what I heard and I'm not going to tell you what I saw while you were preaching tonight. I'm going to write it to you in a letter. So when you get home, expect a handwritten letter from me and I'll tell you what I heard and what I saw. So several weeks later, or a couple of weeks later, uh, when I arrived back home uh, and went to my office, on my desk was a four-page handwritten letter from Oral Roberts. And the first part of it, apparently he went home that night and wrote this letter after he heard me preach. And he said, when I heard you preach tonight, I heard you preaching with a new anointing. It was, an, it was a prophetic anointing. And he said, I encourage you every time you go to the pulpit, preach prophetically. So that was my third mentor who had seen and heard the same thing, just a little bit different terminology. Yeah. And then not too long after that, I was in Tulsa and preaching with Brother Roberts in a minister's conference. Had about 2,000 ministers present. And Brother, Ro Brother Roberts said to me, uh, I'm going to start it out. We're going we're to have a, a double header tonight, he called it. I'm going to start it out and then you close it out. When I get through, I'll... I'll ask you to come up and you close the service out and do whatever the Lord tells you to do. So when I walked up there to the podium, I noticed, I didn't know they were in the meeting, but I noticed my fourth mentor, T.L. and Daisy Osborne. And they were sitting about two rows back from the front. And when I got through preaching, Brother, Ro Brother Osborne uh, met me as I was going uh, back to the speaker's room, he and Daisy, and said, Brother Jerry, uh, we knew you were going to be here tonight, and Daisy and I wanted you to know that we've had you on our mind. We've been praying for you, and God's moving you into a new direction. And he went on and talked about that prophetic ministry. So all four of my mentors from when I first started in 1969, these are the four men that became my mentors, first of all, through their resources, books, and, and, and back then, reel-to-reel -reel tapes, you know, and uh, of course, I, I had met Kenneth Copeland and uh, he came to my hometown and he's the one that when he preached the first time I heard him, that's the man that I heard the word of faith from and it changed my life and I surrendered my life to the Lord that next morning. And then eventually he and I began to work together and we've been preaching together now 
for 53 of my 54 years in the ministry, praise God. And so um, all four of my mentors saw and heard the same thing. So what else could I do but move in, move up, and move out, amen? So since that time, I have been setting aside the first two weeks of October to just seek the Lord and ask Him what my theme would be for the coming new year and what He might show me. And each, each October, He's been very faithful to do that. Sometimes I may hear it the first day. Sometimes it may be two or three days into my, my private time with Him. But this past October, 2023, on the first day that I, I began to seek Him, He said this. Number one, He said, tell the people everywhere you go in 2024. Number one, stay in faith. Number two, remain focused on the promises of God. And number three, do not allow anything in the world to distract you. And he said, if they will do that, then tell them, I will cause their 2024 to be a year of progression, a year of advancement, a year of promotion, and their highest expectations will be fulfilled. Yeah. Now notice it's not automatic. There were some prerequisites. Number one, stay in faith. Everybody say, stay in faith. Stay. Look at your neighbor and say, stay in faith. You know, uh, it's amazing that God would have to tell Christians to stay in faith because the Bible says the just shall live by faith. It's not, it's not, a, uh, it's not a, a choice there. It's a command. The, the just shall live by faith. And so he said, tell them to stay in faith. And then number two, remain focused on the promises of God. You know, when things are not going so well, like in a pandemic, you know, uh, when times are hard, times are difficult, challenging, people tend to forget what God has promised. And that's the reason he said, tell them, remain focused on the promises of God. And then number three, do not allow anything in the world to distract you. Now that is Satan's way of robbing you of what God desires to do for you and what God desires for you to have, distractions. Jesus said in the fourth chapter of Mark, talking about the parable of the sower sows the word, he said, once the word is sown in a man's heart, Satan cometh immediately to take it away or to steal it. And he gave some ways that Satan goes about doing that. But if you read that same story in that same parable in the Amplified Bible, one of the ways that Jesus said, that Satan attempts to steal the word is through the distractions of the age. The distractions of the age. And there are more distractions today than I've ever known in my 54 years of ministry. It is easy to be distracted. Particularly, you know, when I first started, we didn't have social media. You know, when I first started going to Africa, in order to communicate back home, I had to beat drums and send smoke signals. You know, I mean, we were, it was primitive. And uh, staying in mud huts. And this guy gets to stay in resorts. He's not a missionary, you know. <laughs> he's a wannabe. <laughs> but he's a good one, praise God. No, I mean, it was very primitive. I stayed in mud huts with the Africans. I ate their food. And I fought witch doctors. I'd go in, I'd go out to do an open air crusade and I'd come back to that mud hut and that witch doctor filled uh, uh, an army cot, that's what I was sleeping on, and uh, one sheet. And he filled it with lizards every night. And then and stood out there all night and beat a drum and chant, trying to run me out of that village. And one night I pulled that sheet back and I didn't have any light in there. I had to carry a flashlight. And, and it had one little opening with a little little white towel, you know, as a, as a curtain. And he'd slip in there and throw them lizards in my room. And one night I shined that light on those, all those lizards. They were green lizards, brown lizards, little lizards, big lizards. I said, Lord, that witch doctor is not going to run me out of Africa. But if you don't do something with these lizards, I'm leaving on my own. You know? <laughs> so those were the early days, you know, but, uh, you know, a lot of people today, because we have all this modern technology, it's amazing. 
Now, I may be talking to somebody, but social media becomes an addiction. Did my mic go off? I got no response. <laughs> I said, social media, you know, looking up all that stuff can become an addiction. And you can, you can find out what's happening all over the nation, all over the world in just a, a couple of seconds. And a lot of that information you do not need. Well, Brother Jerry, I like to be informed. Are you kidding me? That's where you get your information? Did you know, did you ever wonder why they have to print the newspaper every day? Because by dark, it's old news. Did you notice they never have to reprint anything in this book? Why? Because it's forever settled in heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one word from God. Amen. Amen. I prefer to put God's word first place above all of the distractions of the age. And I believe that's the reason why God said that because so many of his people are distracted today. And because of that, they're not enjoying God's best. I want God's best. Anybody else want God's best? You know, when I first came to the Lord, I knew nothing about the Bible. I'd heard as a kid, you know, the little Bible stories about you know, David and Goliath and Samson and Delilah and, you know, and, and Daniel in the lion's den. But I had no idea. I thought it was just a storybook. And, and, and it was about people that lived a long time ago and really didn't apply to me. And uh, I was shocked when I, when I surrendered my life to the Lord. I owned an automotive business before I went into the ministry. And I, when I shut my business down and began to prepare for full-time ministry, I thought, well, if I'm going to preach, I better read this book, find out what it says, you know. So I started on page one, Genesis, page one. I thought you read it just like any other book. And I got so bogged down and I, I got frustrated. And my wife came in there and said, what are, you, what are you so frustrated about? I said, I can't understand this. She said, why not? I said, well, why don't they, why don't they name people names we know? I can't pronounce all these names. Where's Joe, Bill, Bob? And I said, and this is the begottenest bunch of people I ever read about in my life. Is that all they do? They begot this one. This one begot that one. This one begot that one. I mean, there's several chapters and they're still begotten. She said, don't start in Genesis. Start in the New Testament. Get familiar with the ministry of Jesus. I said, well, where does it start? Matthew. So I found Matthew. And I'd be if they didn't start all over my garden again. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? First chapter of Matthew, they, they're, they're at it again. I said, Carolyn, they're at it again. She said, what are you reading? I said, you told me to read Matthew. And they're begotten again. And they name them names I can't pronounce. She said, well, go over to the epistles. I said, what's an epistle? And she said, uh, start with Paul's writings. Who's Paul? But she had to tell me everything. You know, my, my wife was a Pentecostal girl, grew up in a Pentecostal church. I'd never even heard the word Pentecostal until she and I started dating. And, and she was baptized in the Holy Ghost at eight years old. And she, she obviously knew much more than I did. And so when I first came to the Lord and I started going to the Pentecostal church, that she went to, grew up in, she had to interpret everything for me. As far as I was concerned in the early days, the Holy Ghost and my wife, Carolyn, were one and the same, okay? Because <laughs> she had to tell me everything, you know? And so she said, start reading Paul's letters. And I get over there in Corinthians and find this. Paul said this, I do what I don't want to do. And when I do it, it's not me doing it. I said, well, who's doing it then? It was not you. She said, what are you so frustrated about? I said, I don't understand this. The man said he's doing things he don't want to do. And when he does it, it's not him doing it. Who is it then? She walked over to me, Joel, and she put her hand, uh, little fingers on my forehead and said, help him, Lord. And she said, now get on back in that bedroom where you've been studying and don't come out until God shows you something. I come out and I said, Carolyn, did you know 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the same story. I didn't know that. She said, is that all you've learned? Get on back in there, help him, Lord. You know, Don't laugh, some of you ain't got it yet. And, you know. Well, that was me, you know, like Brother Copeland say, I was scripturally illiterate. And I was shocked when I discovered that you could actually live by the words in this book. That God was a good God, because that's not what I was told as a young boy. I was told God's out to get you. God's going to get you. You know, you keep messing up. You keep sowing all those bad seeds. God's going to get you. And, and I never heard anything that caused me to be attracted to God until Kenneth Copeland came to town and, 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 and preached the word like I'd never heard it before. And somebody that went to Carolyn's church uh, got all the real to real messages that he preached. He was there for a week, three services a day. That's 21 messages. And she had them on reel to reel and came to my house the, the, the day I surrendered my life to the Lord. And she said, Jerry, uh, God told me to get, bring you these. And said, if you'll listen to them, they'll change your life. And I said, well, how am I supposed to listen to them? She said, you don't have a reel to reel tape player? I said, no. She said, I'll be right back. So she went home, came back with a great big tape player that you set on a credenza, you know, and she said, I was hoping you had one. God told me to give you mine, but I was hoping you already had one. So <laughs> that's the reason she went back and got hers. And I set that up in that guest bedroom and turned it into my study. And I started with those real to real tapes, with those basic messages like redeemed from the curse, the blessings of Abraham are ours. Uh, you know, seven steps to prayer that brings results. I mean, just those basic, fundamental, the life of faith. And they were changing my life. And that's when I began to realize that God had some big plans for me. Some big plans for me. Just like he has big plans for everybody in here. You may not do the same thing I'm doing, but God's got plans for you that are just important for you than the plans that he has for me. Amen. And when I discovered those things, I couldn't get enough of the Word of God. I started spending 8, 12, 15 hours a day studying the Word. And the Lord said, if you'd give me the same dedication that you gave to that business, because I, I went into business for myself at 21 years old, and, and I, I, I wanted to be successful at it. My dad was in the automotive business. He taught me everything uh, that he knew. And my dream was to take all that expertise and, and turn it into a business. My dad always wanted to be in business for himself, but never quite got there. And by the time I was 21, I owned my own business. I'm, I'm doing paint and body work. I'm restoring classic cars. Dad and I are building hot rods and race cars, hauling them all over the southern part of the United States. I'm living my dream, you know. And, but I was not living God's dream for me. But when I got in this book, everything changed. I was amazed at, at, at God's plans and God's goodness. And, and I, like I said, I couldn't get enough of the word and, uh, and I still can't. I mean, you would think after 54 years of ministry, preaching, away, being away from my home on the average of 20 days out of every month for 54 years, you'd think by now I would know everything there is to know about that book. But every time I pick it up, I find out the Word of God is inexhaustible. Yeah. You can never get to the place where you say, I know enough. I know it all. Don't pick it up again and you'll find out there's more revelation in every verse. Hallelujah. Amen. So don't ever, don't ever, uh, don't ever get to the point where you say things like, I've already heard that. <clears throat> uh, we've already, we saw that a long time ago. <clears throat> we learned that a long time ago. Well, there's still more to learn. Praise God. Can you say amen? So, uh, I began studying the Word and found out one of the most exciting things I ever found out in those early days was the blessing of God was on my life. And I didn't have to earn it. It wasn't based on something I did. It's based on something Jesus did. Can you say amen? Did you, did you find Psalm 5? Look with me. Or I'm sorry, Psalm 3 first. 
Psalm 3. We'll get to Psalm 5. And look at the closing verse. Verse 5. I will get this straight in just a moment. Verse 8, okay. Look at this. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. Now notice, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Another translation says, salvation comes from the Lord. Okay, salvation comes from God. But then notice, his blessing is on his people. How many of you consider yourself one of God's people? Then the blessing of God is on your life right now. It's not something you're going to get when you go to heaven. It is on your life now. And it came on your life the moment you made Jesus the Lord of your life. Now, I didn't know those things. But when I began to study that, I was, I was amazed to find out that I didn't have to become so good as a Christian that one day God might possibly, if I'm real good, you know, put his blessing on me. That's not the way it works at all. You could never get good enough for it. You, you could never get to the place where you earn it. Jesus got it for you, praise God. Amen. And now it says the blessing is on his people. So if you consider yourself one of God's people, the blessing is on you right now. Yeah. I walked in here with it on me. I'm going to walk out of here with it on me. I'm going to get on my airplane and fly to Texas tomorrow morning with the blessing on me. I'm going to get up the next day with a blessing on me. I'm going to spend the rest of my life with a blessing on me. Not only that, I expect it to manifest everywhere I go. Hallelujah. The blessing in its, in its truest meaning, the blessing means the empowerment to prosper, the empowerment to to increase the empowerment to multiply, to excel and to rise above what keeps everybody else down. That's what the blessing is all about. It's an empowerment. And you know, it's amazing to me that most Christians, if you were to ask them, what is the blessing? You can't imagine the kind of answers you would get. In a lot of Christian homes, they never, they never even hear the word bless until somebody sneezes. I don't know where we got that, but you know, somebody see, God bless you. And that's the only thing they ever hear about the blessing. I've taught my children and my grandchildren and my, my, I came to, to the Lord in 1969. My oldest daughter was born in 68. My youngest daughter was born in 69. And, and they were my first congregation. I mean, when they couldn't even set up good, wasn't even walking good, I propped them up on a couch and I put pillows next to them and I preached to them and they wrote, fell, fell over and I thought, wow, the power of God hit them. Hallelujah. <laughs> I prop them back up and preached to them again. You know? So all they've ever known is what I'm saying to you. You know, when I, when I talk about my life BC before Christ, they don't know that man. They've never known that man. All they've known is my daddy, the faith man. Hallelujah. Amen. And so uh, I, I began teaching them when they, couldn't, when they really couldn't even understand. But I started teaching it at an early age that the blessing of God is on your life. And that means you are empowered to prosper. You are empowered to increase. You are empowered to excel. You are empowered to rise above. And, and, you know, when, when somebody would sneeze in our house, if it was somebody, you know, a, a guest and they, they weren't, you know, schooled in the way we were, and they would say, uh, bless you, to one of my girls, they'd say, they'd put their hands on their hips and say, God's already blessed us and we are empowered to prosper. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. My grand, one of my grandsons, uh, he, he, he loved riding motorcycles with me. And he, he begged me from the time he's three years old, Papa, buy me a motorcycle. I said, well, you're not quite old enough yet, but when you get to be about six, I'll take you down to the Honda store and I'll buy you a little motorcycle and put some training wheels on it and, and we'll teach you how to ride and everything. So when he, his mom, my oldest daughter, and, 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 and the family would all come together for a meal or special occasion, 
when it's time to eat, he'd raise his hand and said, Mama, let me pray. And here's his prayer every time. Jesus, thank you for this food and tell Papa to buy me a motorcycle. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and so when he got to the age I said, I took him to the Honda store, bought him a little, you know, what do they call him? Honda 50s or something. And uh, had put training wheels on it, bought all the gear for him and took it home and put him on it and taught him some things there and, and let him ride it around the backyard, you know. And then he wanted to put it in my shop where I have my motorcycles. So every time he'd come to my house, he'd, he'd have it right there. And so he wanted it parked right next to mine. Well, they came over to the house one day and I'm, I'm working on my motorcycle, getting ready to go on a tour on it. And he came out there, saw me and he, he, he picked up some tools and was trying to do what he saw me do, you know. And he, he picked up a wrench. He'd look over there, see what I was doing and he'd act like he was doing it. And he sneezed and I heard him, but I was, I was so you know, focused on what I was doing. I didn't say anything. And he got up and walked over there, just like his mama when she was a little girl, put his hands on his hip. Papa, I sneezed and you didn't empower me to prosper. I said, well, excuse me, empower you to prosper. He said, thank you. And then he went back and worked on his motorcycle. <laughs> so that's all we know at our house. Blessed means empowered to prosper. Amen. And notice it says, the blessing is on his people. You, did you know you have something on you that empowers you to prosper no matter what the conditions are in the world? Right. I'll prove it to you in just yeah, a moment. No matter what's going on in the world, when you know you have the blessing of God on your life, you will rise above what's going on in the world. You will excel. When others are failing, you will, you will go, you'll be going to the top. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You ought to thank God every day of your life, if you don't already, that you have the blessing of God on your life. In fact, I think you ought to do it right now. Can you give the Lord your best shout and thank him for the blessing? Hallelujah. Amen. Now go over to Psalm five and here's something else that comes with the blessing. Psalm five and verse 12. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compass him as with a shield? Notice the blessing and favor come together. You can't have one without the other. Can't have one without the other. Now, I, I was on a tour a number of years ago, and, and I've, I've preached all over the world about the favor of God. I, I believe I'd be safe in saying without sounding egotistical I don't think there's other preacher in my generation that's ever preached more sermons, written more books, and produced more resources on the subject of favor than myself. Because it was the first thing God taught me, the blessing and favor. And he said in those early days, that there, there, someday the favor of God will be so uh, manifesting in your life that your, your name will be known around the world for the favor of God. And then I'll hold you responsible for teaching others how to walk in it as you do. And that's what's happened over the years. And, and notice here, it says, with favor, he will accomplish you as with a shield. In other words, another translation said, he'll surround you with his favor. And, and I was on this motorcycle tour a number of years ago. I just preached in Keith Moore's church in Branson, Missouri. And then I was riding uh, with a group of our biker uh, club uh, to Tulsa to preach. And on the way over there, and, and my church like group, Christian bikers, they know if Brother Jerry pulls off the highway and over, you know, to the side of the road, God just said something to him and he wants all of us to hear it. And so we're riding along there on our way to Tulsa. And boy, God said something to me I'd never heard before. I pulled off. They all gathered up there. What did the Lord say to you? I said, it, it, was, it was a revelation. I'd never thought about this, never heard it before. The Lord, I'm riding along there, and he said, if my blessing is the empowerment to prosper, what is my favor for? And I thought about it, and I couldn't answer. I mean, I had some ideas, but before I could answer, he said, the blessing is the empowerment to prosper. Favor creates the opportunities to make it happen. Wow. That's good. You ought to write that down. Amen. The blessing is the empowerment to prosper. 
But favor creates the opportunities to make it happen. Amen. And you ought to get up every day of your life. Because notice, this belongs to the people of God. And you said a few moments moments ago that you are one of God's people. So that means you already have the favor of God and you already have the blessing of God. And you ought to get up every morning thanking God for it. And as you walk out of your house, declare. Because the Bible says in Job 22, that thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. The literal Hebrew says, if you decree it enough, eventually it will become a common occurrence in your life. So you ought to get up every day as I do. There's not a day goes by that I don't get up before I leave my house and I thank God for his blessing. I thank God for his favor. And I decree somehow, some way before dark, the blessing is going to empower me to prosper. And the favor of God is going to create the opportunity to make it happen. And you ask anybody that knows me well, follows me, travels with me, it happens everywhere I go. I said it happens everywhere I go. I've had it happen since I've been here. Hallelujah. Amen. And it's not because I'm so special. It's because Jesus is so special. He's the one that arranged it for us. Amen. Can you give him a shout of praise? Hallelujah. The only difference between me and perhaps some of you, I may know more about it. I may know more about how to appropriate it, but you can do the same thing. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved. I I always like to say this, do yourself a favor and study favor. (laughs) Amen. Study favor. You're going to find out some exciting things that favor will produce in your life and you'll never be the same. Hallelujah. So notice We have the blessing of God and we have the favor of God. Now, how does that relate to that prophetic word the Lord gave me about 2024? Progression, advancement, promotion. The favor of God and the blessing of God is designed to make that happen for you. Now, I'm going to take you through some scripture in the Bible to show you how that the blessing of God and the favor of God will bring progression. It will bring advancement. It will bring promotion. God never intended, and I've said this in every service I've preached in Canada this tour, God never intended for anybody in this room or anybody watching my live stream, if you're a Christian, He never intended for you to remain as you are right now. No matter how good you're having it, No matter how blessed you might be at this moment, there's always another level. And God wants to take you there. Amen? God wants to take you there. Don't always be grateful for where you're at and give God the praise that he brought you this far. But he doesn't expect you to be satisfied. The Bible says in Psalm 115, the Lord increase thee more and more. You are blessed of the Lord. The blessing of God is designed to produce increase. Increase is progression. Increase is advancement. Increase is promotion. And God's blessing will bring increase into your life. So if it, if the blessing of the Lord brings increase more and more, then that means I haven't seen all the increase I'm going to experience. You haven't seen all the increase God has in store for you. And Paul wrote about it in 2 Corinthians. He said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Notice there are things that we haven't even experienced yet that God has already arranged for those who love him. And I'm sure if I ask the question, how many in here love God? Everybody would raise their hand. So that means you qualify. Yep. There are things waiting out there that you haven't tapped into yet, but they belong to you because you love God. Hallelujah. Amen. He's arranged for it. Yep. Can you say amen? Yep. So that means as I'm, as I'm making my daily walk of faith as a Christian, I am marching toward every day of my life progression advancement. 
Amen. I, I, I do not expect, and I don't mind telling you, and I give all the praise to God. I am extremely blessed. I am highly favored. But I do not expect to be by the end of this year where I am right now standing here talking to you. In fact, if I was to come back at the end of this year, I would have testimonies after testimonies after testimony of how God has brought increase and advancement and promotion. And he's no respecter of persons. If he'd do it for me, he would do it for you. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, aren't you glad you heard that tonight? Praise God. Amen. Now, let's, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Talks about the blessings of Abraham. <clears throat> and as you know, the first 14 verses or so talk about the blessings. The remainder of the chapter talk about the curses. But the good thing is Jesus has redeemed us from the curse, okay? But you will notice if you study the curses, many of them imply that one of the curses is you remain as you are. You never prosper. You, you sow seed and it never produces much of a harvest. Uh, you, you, you plant vineyards and it never produces much of a, 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 a a crop, vineyard. What's that? It's staying as you are. That's a curse. God never intended for you to stay as you are. Amen. And he redeemed you from the curse of it. Hallelujah. Yeah. So if you're not staying where you are and that's under the curse, then what's left? Progress. <laughs> Go forward. Experience more. And when you get to more, there's more. When you get to that next more, there's more. And when you get to that more, there's even more. Hallelujah. I really appreciate your enthusiasm tonight. Huh? More and more. Increase more and more. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm entitled to increase more and more. Yes. Hallelujah. You know, I heard Brother Copeland say years ago, he said, a lot of people think that uh, that banquet table in Psalm 23 is a heavenly banquet table, but it's not. And I've heard many preachers say, oh, when we get to heaven, Psalm 23 says he will prepare a banquet for us. And they stop right there. But they didn't read the last part. In the presence of our enemies. Uh, I, I don't know if you've heard, but the devil's not going to heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody thrilled about that? Praise God. He said he's going to prepare a banquet for us in the presence of our enemy. My enemy is not in heaven. He's not going to heaven. So that is not a earthly, that is not a heavenly banquet. I'm sure we'll have plenty heavenly banquets, but the one in Psalm 23 is not it. That's an earthly banquet in the presence of our enemy. And Brother Copeland said, the problem God has, he can't get his kids to come to the table. They all want to put it off till they get to heaven. And I've noticed I'm sitting at that banquet table and a lot of chairs are empty and if you don't come to the table I'm going to eat mine and yours <laughs> amen amen so we're entitled to a whole lot more than religious tradition has told us about can you say amen, amen. Let's, let's let the word be final authority not some man not some doctrine not some you know religious tradition. Let the word of God be final authority. So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to read some verses, not all of them, and I'm going to read them from the message translation to show you that the blessing includes progression and advancement. In the message translation, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, it says, God, your God, will place you on high high above all the nations of the earth, all these blessings will come down on you and spread out beyond you. Verse six says, God's blessing in your coming in, God's blessing in your going out 
Verse 11 says, God will lavish you with good things. And verse 13 says, and you'll always be on top. Hallelujah. Doesn't that sound like progression to you? Amen. Progression, advancement. That's part of the blessing. That's what the blessing will produce. Become familiar with how to walk under the covering of the blessing and under the the canopy of favor, hallelujah. Now, the blessing brings possession, uh, pro- progression, advancement, and promotion. Now, in Proverbs chapter 10, would you go there with me very quickly? Proverbs chapter 10. <clears throat> and look at verse 10. 22. The blessing. Everybody say the blessing. blessing. So what are we talking about in this verse? The blessing. The blessing. What does it do? The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and addeth no sorrow to it. Notice the blessing of God will progressively cause you to prosper. When I came into this in 1969, and I, I had a lot of debt in my business. Uh, I wish I could have launched out into ministry being debt free, but that was not the case. I had a lot of debt in my business. And, and uh, the Lord had instructed me to shut it down, spend the next three months studying the word and preparing for full time ministry. <clears throat> I used up, excuse me, <clears throat> all that I had just to exist, putting food on the table, you know, and so forth. And I began to find out these things about the blessing. And so I began believing for it. I said, God, uh, I'm I'm now serving you. You said your blessings on my life. And I need manifestations of it just to make it day by day. Okay. And I found out this verse said, the blessing, it. The blessing, it maketh rich. Now, another translation says it this way. The blessing makes for a rich life. And a rich life would include divine health, peace of mind. Amen. I mean, there's a lot of things that you could you could include in a rich life. That means you you don't come up short all the time. You're not living from paycheck to paycheck. And the blessing will cause you to experience a rich life. And, and a rich life does not just mean financially prosperous, even though it includes it, but it doesn't end there. You know, there, uh, how many of you remember the name Aristotle Onesis? One of the richest men in the world. But his money couldn't pay for his health. I said his money couldn't pay for his health. He could build his own personal hospital and hire the, the most brilliant medical people on the planet with the money he had, but it couldn't buy his health. So I don't call that a rich life. Have all this money and you're dying of an incurable disease that medical science cannot help you. That's not a rich life. A rich life is like third John two, beloved. I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Amen. I mean, what better life could anybody imagine but being prosperous and living in good health? Not having to spend all your money on trying to just be in health. You know, I I got hold of these things as a young man back in 1969 and began to apply them. I first believed them. I received them by faith. I learned how to apply the principles uh, with them. And, and God honored it. He's faithful. He said in Psalm 89, 34, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has come from my lips. So you never have to be concerned about whether or not God will keep his word, that God will honor his word. I like to tell people all, the world, all over the world, God is the original promise keeper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. If you can't trust God, who can you trust? I remember one time when I first started in ministry, I was preaching this little tiny Pentecostal church in Arkansas. I mean, in the the boon 
in the woods. Wasn't a handful of people in there. <clears throat> and most of them didn't believe a word I had to say because they had been taught. In fact, one of them challenged me and, and I didn't know he could do that while I'm preaching. <laughs> I mean, i would never been to the seminary. I didn't know people could stand up and challenge you. <clears throat> and I had, I was talking about living in victory and living under the blessing. And I'm very young, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> and this man stood up and said, well, I'll tell you what, and he called me whippersnapper. You ever heard that word? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, you little whippersnapper. Jesus said in the world, you'll have tribulation. And the whole church went, yes, amen. And the pastor said, uh-huh. <laughs> the whole church is against me. <clears throat> they did not want me taking their tribulations away from them. They wanted to suffer. And I said, well, sir, and I turned to the pastor, I said, is he allowed to do that? <laughs> I mean, I, I came out of a pain body shop. I, I don't know religious politics. Is he allowed to do that? And he wouldn't answer me. I said, well, let me get back to what I said. He stood up again and said, well, I'll tell you one thing. Jesus said, in the world, you'll have tribulation. Everybody said, yes, amen. Pastor said, uh-huh. I said, okay, sir, <clears throat> since you took it upon yourself to challenge me, would you tell me where that verse is? So far, everything I've said, I've given you chapter and verse. Now give me the chapter and verse on that. Here's what he said. Well, I don't know where it is, but I know it's in there. I said, that's not good enough. If I'd have come in here and said, all these wonderful things and said, I I'm not sure where that is in the Bible, but just believe me. Right. You wouldn't have accepted that. Right. I said, so find it. He said, I didn't bring my Bible with me. I said, anybody in the amen corner got a Bible back there? Nobody brought a Bible. I said, pastor, you got a Bible? He didn't even bring his Bible. He was in his office. I said, well, sir, let me help you. Jesus said in the 16th chapter of John, the last verse, in the world, you shall have tribulation. And he stood up and said, see there, I told you. I said, wait a minute, sir. I'm not finished. Jesus not finished. I said, the next word is but. I said, now I'm not an English scholar, but I did learn in school that but is a conjunction. It means he's not through talking. And it also means thou shalt not stop reading. Jesus said, in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. That changes everything. <clears throat> changes everything. See, religion only reads portions of the scripture. Religious tradition only reads portions. For instance, 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, you know, uh, we're troubled on every side. Religion stops right there and says, oh, yes, bless his holy name. <laughs> but that's not what Paul said. He said, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. That changes everything. But religious tradition wants to be troubled. Oh, we got trouble. Hallelujah. We're so <laughs> scriptural. We're troubled. Everybody in my house is troubled. And I started going to... This is Pentecostal churches thinking they wanted to hear the word. I was shocked that Christians didn't want to hear the word. And they'd have, I'd never been in, you know, testimony services. And here's how the testimonies would go most of the time. Pastor would say, anybody got a testimony? Some lady would raise her hand. Oh, I have a testimony. The devil visited our house this week. Everybody in our house is sick. And my husband had to get laid off from work. And oh, dear God, bless his holy name. <laughs> <clears throat> and then somebody would say, I've got a testimony. And they would try to, you know, make it better than that one. Yeah. You think the devil visited your house? He lives at our house. <laughs> lives at our house every day, 24-7. You don't know the trouble we've seen. Blessed be his holy name. <laughs> I said, well, that's a testimony. God never got any credit for anything, you know? And then, and then many times they'd add this. Uh, 
We, uh, we all know that God is able. <coughs> and I told my wife one day, I said, <clears throat> the next time I hear one of these people give a testimony and say at the end of it, but we all know our God is able, I'm going to go ask him, did he? And I did one night. And I, my wife was always saying, don't embarrass me. I said, I'm not going to embarrass you. Inquiring minds want to know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you keep praying, I'll be like you folks. And I don't want to be like these folks. They're, they're tribulating. They're troubled. They're happy about it. And the devil lives with them every day. I don't want to be like them. You know? And so this lady gave that same stupid testimony. And at the end, but we all know our God is able. I walked up to her and I said, did he? She said, what? I said, did God do what you said he was able to do? Oh, you never know what God's going to do. I said, lady, that's not what you said. You said, we all know God is able. Right. Now, did he? Uh, well, I'm not sure what you mean. I said, lady, you said that the devil visited your house. Everybody got sick. Your husband got laid off. But we all know God is able. Now, I want to know, did he do what you said he's able to do? Well, we never know what God's going to do. I wanted to say, well, then just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I controlled myself. Yeah. Now, I wasn't completely sanctified in those days, but I did suppress wanting to tell her to shut up. If you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. <laughs> so good. Amen. Yep. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, where he talks about we're troubled on every side, you know, we're persecuted. But each time there's a yet and a but. And I tell people, don't leave out the buts because the buts change the scenery. It changes everything. Amen. So notice the blessing is designed to bring prosperity and it's designed to produce a rich life mm -hmm. in everyone who will receive it. Anybody in here receive it? Praise God. Yes. Amen. All right. Now let's, uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 12. And I want you to, I want you to see, and I'm sure many of you know this Genesis chapter 12. This is where Excuse me, God introduces himself to a man by the name of Abram. And he says to him in verse 1, <clears throat> Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. Now if you haven't underlined or highlighted that, that phrase, I will bless thee. And once again, it means I will empower you to prosper. I will empower you to increase, excel, rise above. And then he says this, and as I bless you, eventually you will become a blessing, <clears throat> which means that you will have enjoyed the benefits of the blessing and what it will produce that now you'll be able to help other people who are in need. That's what a blessing is. I asked the Lord when I first read that years ago, I said, give me a definition of what being a blessing is. And he said, you become my instrument pre uh, 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 preventing misfortune in the lives of others. Amen. He said, I will bless you. I will empower you to prosper. And then eventually, because you're prospering, you will become an instrument preventing misfortune in the lives of others. And that's what my wife and I, we, we got a hold of that and we said, Lord, that's where we're headed. That's what we're going to be. Amen. We're blessed to be a blessing. Hallelujah. We bless people all over the world. We bless ministries all over the world. We, we help people. I, I, I've been to many nations where I did the planning, I did the building, but a lot of nations we go to, we don't, we don't reinvent the wheel. We find people with a vision similar to ours an assignment similar to ours. And, and many of them, they just need financial help to get it done. And because we're blessed, we bless them. 
and help them get the project done instead of reinventing it. Amen? That's, that's, that's all come because we learned 54 years ago of what it means to be blessed and to be favored. And it brought progression, it brought advancement, and it brought promotion. And it's designed to do that for everybody in this room. Can you say amen? amen. Would you lift your hands right now and say one more time, Lord, thank you for your blessing on my life. And thank you for your favor on my life. I am blessed to be a blessing in Jesus' name. And can you give him a good praise for it? Hallelujah. Amen. Now, notice he said, I will bless you. Now, if you read the Amplified Bible, it says, I will bless you and I will give you an abundant increase of favor. So you can't, you can't, you can't separate blessing from favor. You can't have one without the other. When you got the blessing, you get the favor. Amen. They work hand in hand. The blessing is the empowerment to prosper and the favor creates the opportunities to make it happen. Praise God. So notice here, God promised Abram that he would bless him and he would bring favor to him. Now look at chapter 13 and verse two. And notice we'll see in one chapter later, the blessing's already working. Look at verse two. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Why was he very rich in silver and cattle in gold? Because God blessed him. The blessing was working in one chapter. I like to ask people, how many chapters will it take you? <laughs> Amen. One chapter later, and the blessing is already working in this man's life. Okay. And notice it brought progression. It brought advancement. It brought promotion. Now go with me to uh, chapter 14, chapter 14. Everybody still here? Yeah. Are you receiving? Yeah. Chapter 14 and notice uh, these, these forces have come against Abraham and Lot and family and, and Abraham takes his own uh, servants and goes into battle with them and overcomes them, takes their spoil. And then he meets with Melchizedek. And in verse 22, it says, And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Then notice what Abraham said, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say that I have made Abraham rich. What is he saying? I don't need anything from you because the blessing on my life, God has empowered me to prosper through it. Hallelujah. We don't have to run to the world. The world ought to be looking to us. Amen. He said, I will not take anything you have. They tried, they tried to give him all the spoil. He said, I don't want anything you got. I don't want a string out of your sandals. I don't want anything you've got because I don't want anybody ever saying they made Abraham rich. I'll be able to say the rest of my life, it was God and his blessing on my life that made me rich. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, folks, this has been in the Bible all the time. And I, 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 it's hard for me to understand why people, and I'm talking about Christian and preachers even have the idea that it's not God's will for us to be blessed. It's not God's will for us to prosper. It's there in black and white. Notice I'm not reading from first Jerry. I'm reading from Genesis. <laughs> I didn't make this up. I'm just reading it. I believe it. And it's working for me. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And when you're a doer of the word, James says, you'll be blessed in your deed. Can you say amen? So it's all over the Bible. When you see the blessing on somebody's life, just keep reading. They're going to prosper. They're going to rise above. They're going to excel. They're going to progress. They're going to advance. They're going to experience promotion. 
It's just the way it is. It's the way God set it up. Hallelujah. Can you say amen to that? Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 15. You're right there close. And look at uh, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. The uh, Amplified Bible says, I am your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceedingly great. I am your abundant compensation, and your reward for trusting me, keeping my word, walking with me, will be exceeding great. Hallelujah. What else can you get out of that but progression, advancement, and promotion? Everybody's still here? I think I've heard from God. Keep the faith. Focus on the promises. Don't let anything in the world distract you. By the end of this year, if you do those things, and it's not automatic, but if you apply those principles, then you're going to look back on this year and you're going to be able to say, God indeed caused me to progress and advance and I experienced promotion. Hallelujah. Why don't you go ahead and give him a praise in advance? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 24 and see what this blessing produced at the end or by the time Abraham is an old man and what the Bible says the blessing had produced in his life. Verse one, and Abram, Abraham was old, well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Another translation says in every way. Another translation says in every regard. And another says in all respects. Does all mean up here what it means in Texas? <laughs> all? <laughs> Blessed him in every way. Blessed the work of his hand. Ble blessed him in every way. Blessed him coming in. Blessed him going out. Blessed him in the city. Blessed him in the field. I had uh, our art department <clears throat> a number of years ago uh, make uh, print up some doormats. And uh, uh, when you put it at, at your door, when you walk in on this bottom side, it says, I am blessed going in. And then when you turn around to go back outside, it says, and I am blessed going out. And we have partners all over the world that have them. In, 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 their, in fact, some people have them at every door in their house. And the reason I had them done that way is because the Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. So when you read it, you can run with it. So I wanted people to become uh, 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 engrossed with the idea that God wants them blessed. And I wanted them to see that scripture every time they walked in, every time they walked out. I'm blessed coming in, I'm blessed going out. Blessed coming in, blessed going out. Blessed coming in, blessed going out. After a while, you keep reading that and you're going to believe it. <laughs> and it's going to start working for you. Amen. Hallelujah. So notice by the time Abraham is an old man, I, 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 I'm, I'm one of these my wife says, strange birds that loves getting older. I love getting older. I'm 77. And when I, when I turned 77, a week later, I was already talking about, boy, when I get to be 78. She said, Jerry, you just turned 77. I said, yeah, but I'm looking forward to being 78. She said, why are you like this? I said, because there's wonderful promises in the Bible for people when they get older. One scripture says, and they will still be flourishing. They will still be prospering. I, I don't have visions of sitting on a front porch in a rocking chair and then coming and wiping my face. I'm flourishing. And I intend to keep on flourishing. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to being 90. I'm getting, I'm getting closer. I said, I said, when I learned these things back there in 1969, I stood up one day and I said, Carolyn, I will live longer than any of my ancestors. 
With long life, he satisfies me. And I heard Brother Hagin say back in those early days, if you ever hear I'm gone, it's because I got satisfied. And I said, that's exactly what I'm going to start saying. If you ever hear I'm gone, it's simply because I got satisfied. Well, I'm 77 and I'm not satisfied. So I just, I'm just going to keep on and keep on flourishing because that's what the promise of God said. Hallelujah. Amen. So notice the blessing is designed to make life rich, a rich life. I wouldn't trade places with anybody on this planet. I'm already God's favorite child. Why would I want to change? No, that's the way he makes me feel. But you do come a close second. I just want you to let you know that. No, he doesn't love me anymore and he loves you. Doesn't love you anymore and he loves me. But he just makes me feel so special because he's been so good to me. Amen. Can any of you in here say, he's made me feel so special. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I must be his favorite child. <clears throat> Amen. Now, go back to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. And here's where you and I come in. We're talking about Abraham so far. Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generation. I will establish this covenant. And, and if you've taken notes, write right out beside covenant. Or I will establish this covenant a covenant of increase. That's what it is. A covenant of increase. And notice here he says to Abraham, I will not only establish my covenant with you and your seed, but your seed that comes after you in their generation. You say, well, how does that relate to me? Glad you asked. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And we saw all this progression and all this advancement and all this promotion in Abraham's life. And if you read about Isaac, his son, his seed, you'll see the same thing. You'll see it in Jacob. You'll see it in Joseph. You'll see it in David. The seed, the seed, the seed follows the lineage. And you'll find out they were all blessed. They all experienced progression, advancement, promotion. And then he says, and I'm going to make this happen for not only your seed, but your seed after you in their generation. Galatians chapter 3, Paul picks up on this and he makes this statement. Verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curses every man that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. And that's just a word for non believers. Okay? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. That represents you and me. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And that's not talking about, even though it includes, it's not talking about the promise of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the promise that the Holy Spirit made as God's representative to Abraham. Amen. And he says, you're redeemed from the curse. And now you are entitled to the blessing of Abraham. And notice it says in verse 29, and if you be Christ, or if you are one of Christ, you've made him the Lord of your life, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Yes. That's good. I thought you'd be a little more excited about that. You are now Abraham's seed. You are Abraham's seed in our generation. Amen. That's what I go around saying. I am entitled to every blessing that Abraham received 
because I am his seed in my generation. So that means if Abraham progressed, Jerry will progress. If Abraham advanced, Jerry will advance. If Abraham experienced promotion, Jerry will experience promotion. If Abraham was blessed in every area of his life, then Jerry will be blessed in every area of his life. If Abraham increased, Jerry's going to increase. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. This is, this was God's plan. It's the reason Jesus came is to redeem us and to take us out of the hands of the enemy and place that blessing on us that once was on Abraham. And now praise God, we are entitled to live in a world that knows nothing about this and rise above what keeps them down, excel. We, we're, we're, we're headed to the top when they're headed to the bottom. Why? Because of the blessing and because of the favor of God. Please give the Lord another shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let me close it with this. I'm not done. I don't ever get through. I just have to find a place to stop because this is so rich. I could do this all night if you would stay. <laughs> Go with me to Genesis chapter 26. And I want to show you how that the blessing and the favor of God will produce progression despite adversity. The, the blessing and the favor of God will produce progression and advancement and promotion no matter what's going on in the world around us. And that's good news. I think I, would, I, I trust that you would agree. Yeah. Genesis chapter 26. Verse 1 says, And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Now, if you remember the story of Abraham, when there was a famine in the land, the first famine, Abraham went to Egypt and made a big mistake by going there. So God tells Isaac, his son, do not go to Egypt. In other words, don't run from the crisis and he tells him why. Because I will bless you and I will be with you. When God says, I will bless you and I will be with you, then you don't have to worry about a thing. No matter what's going on around you, if God is with you and God is blessing you, then you're going to rise above what the rest of the world is experiencing. Amen? So notice he said, go not down into Egypt. In fact, Egypt... I like to say represents leaning to the arm of the flesh, trying to make things happen without God. God wants us to live by the blessing, live under his favor and watch him make things happen that we couldn't make happen on our own in a thousand years. And then he says, sojourn in the land. I will be with thee. I will bless thee. And then verse six says, and Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And then look at verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward. The man waxed great and went forward. Sounds like progression to me. The man waxed great and went forward, grew until he became very great. Sounds like advancement to me. For he had possession of flocks, possession of herds, <clears throat> great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. Now, the, the uh, Amplified Bible says that he had, uh, the Lord had favored him with blessings. And it goes on to say in the Amplified, where it says in the King James, and the man waxed great. That, that's not a phrase we use in Texas, and I don't think it's used up here either. When's the last time somebody asked you, how are you doing today? Waxing great, thank you. <laughs> no, we, nobody says that in Texas, but here's what it means, okay? The Amplified Bible says, 
And the man became great and gained more and more until he became very wealthy and distinguished. That's waxing great. How many of you would like to wax great? I dare you tomorrow, if anybody says to you, how you doing? And you say, waxing great, thank you. And just leave it and walk off and let them figure it out on their own. And then if they say, what did you mean by that? You should have been in church last night. <laughs> I do that for fun. I, I do that for fun when people that I don't even know are saying, you know, hey, Brother Jerry, uh, we've never met, but I love your ministry. And how you doing today? Waxing great, thank you. And just walk off and let it hang there, you know. So the Amplified defines waxing great as gaining more and more, becoming very wealthy and distinguished. And then the message translation says, he got richer and richer by the day until he become very wealthy. Now this is not all about money. That, don't, please don't misunderstand me. It's not all about possessions, but it does include them. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to experience increase in every area of your life. He wants you to progress. He wants, and the reason being, here's the bottom line. It's not just so your life will be better. It's so that your life becomes an attraction to somebody. And they're going to eventually say, how are you doing this? Where are you getting all this? And you'll be able to say, it's the God I serve. It's his blessing on my life. It's his favor on my life. Would you like to know my God? Anybody who's ever asked me that and I responded that way has never turned me down when I said, would you like to know my Jesus? Nobody. What attracted them was my lifestyle. Amen. They didn't know it was the blessing. In fact, I've been said, I've been, I've been told this I don't know how many times. Jerry Savelle, you're the luckiest man I've ever known. I said, sir, it's not luck. It's the blessing. It's the favor of God. Hallelujah. And, and in a little while, I'll say, go ahead and touch me. It might get on you. Hallelujah. Huh? It's the blessing. So that's why God wants you to progress. And particularly in the time in which we live today. Because folks, I believe all of you would agree. If you've got any spiritual, if your spiritual antenna is headed toward heaven, Jesus is coming soon. We could very well be the generation that will usher in King Jesus. And that means there's still a whole lot of people that need to hear the gospel. Amen. And one of the ways that they will be attracted to the God we serve is them seeing his blessing at work in our lives and his favor at work in our lives. They don't know it's the blessing. They don't know it's the favor. We know it's the blessing. We know it's the favor. And that's what we'll tell them. I live this way because it's the God I serve. It's his blessing on my life. It's his favor on my life. Would you like to know my God? Amen. The Bible says there will be multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And God wants us progressing so that we can reach those people that are in the valley of decision. Amen. Amen. You receive that tonight. Praise God. Amen. Lift your hands and thank God. Hallelujah. This, this proves in this story, and about the Apostle Paul tells us in his writings that all of these things were written for our benefit. These stories that we read in the Old Testament, they were written for our benefit. The stories we read of the people that lived under the entrance of the New Testament, they were all written for our admonition. Amen. In other words, it, they, they're designed to, to inspire us to live for God and to not turn back, not give up. And to show us what will happen when you follow his instructions, do what he said. See, this story would not be the same if Isaac had gone to Egypt. So hearing God's instructions was extremely important to his progressing. Amen. And that's why God has made available to you the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Don't we serve a wonderful God? Can you give him praise tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet, please? Glory to God. We thank you, Lord. My goodness, do not look at your watch. You'll be moved by what you see. 
I apologize for going this late, but I promise when we get to heaven, I'll give this time back to you, okay? Praise <laughs> God. Thank you so much for allowing me to, to minister to you tonight. Let me get up here where you can see me. I look taller when I get on the platform. <laughs> Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you tonight and, and, uh, and how receptive you were. Pastors, thank you once again for inviting us to come. It's been a joy being with you. And I want you to lift your hands right now, and I want to pray over each and every one of you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I have, I have done the, to the best of my ability to deliver tonight what you put on my heart to share with this wonderful group of people. I pray that something that was said has, has entered their hearts and caused a fresh insight and a fresh revelation of who they truly are in your sight, your people, the blessed and the highly favored. And may they walk out of here tonight with a new view of what the blessing is designed to do, new insight in what the favor of God is designed to do, and a new determination to learn how to walk in it, learn how to experience it on a daily basis. This is not something you want to happen to us every once in a while or every other year or on Easter or Christmas. This is something you want happening to us every day of our lives. Jesus has made it possible for us to walk in this and to live in this. And I pray in Jesus' name that from this night forward, there will come testimonies of some major changes, some major breakthroughs, some major turnarounds in their lives in the name of Jesus. And may we, they, when they walk out of this place, they walk out with a joy in their heart that perhaps they haven't known before. Another level. Peace in their heart that perhaps they haven't experienced before. Another level of it. You're always desiring for us to go to a next level. And I thank you for allowing me to be here tonight and sharing these principles and these truths to them. And I'm expecting over the next few days, next few weeks, Pastor Joel communicating with Brother Joe, our international director, and sharing testimonies of how this word has changed the lives of many people in here tonight. And we thank you in advance for it. We praise you for it. And now, Father, I take authority over every religious spirit that would attempt to steal this word out of the heart of anybody who heard it in here tonight. I bind that spirit. I render it helpless and inoperative. In Jesus' name. Jesus, you said when you were in the earth, you said that the, the, the traditions of men make the commandments of God of no effect. We're not going to allow the traditions of men to interfere with the truth that we've heard. Your word says that your word will not return unto you void. It will prosper in the thing whereunto you've sent it. It will fulfill the purpose that you sent it for. And in Jesus' name, I'm believing, and I believe many of them are agreeing with me, that this word is lodged deeply in their hearts and it will produce exactly what you designed for it to produce. One translation says, every word from God has an assignment on it. An assignment on it. An assignment to be fulfilled. And I speak over each person within the sound of my voice and I declare over them that because the blessing is on their life and the favor of God is on their life, something new is about to take place. You're the God of new things. They are headed for days of progression and advancement and promotion beyond anything they've ever experienced up to now. 
And we give you all the praise for it. We give you all the glory for it. For you are the God who does all things well. Come on, give him praise right now. Give him praise right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Now lay your hands on somebody next to you. Just lay your hands on somebody next to you and say these words. In the name of Jesus, I believe you are not just a hearer only, you are a doer of the word. And as you apply what you've heard tonight, you're going to be blessed in all your deeds. In fact, you're going to be so blessed that people are going to ask, what have you been up to? And you're going to tell them, I've been up to God. I've been up to the Word. Hallelujah. And give the Lord another shout. Hallelujah. I'm going to pass it. Amen. Amen. You received that, church. That's wonderful. What a powerful word. Dr. Zavell, thank you so much again. Man, were you blessed by that, church? That was, man, wonderful. Uh, you may be seated just for a quick moment. What we're going to do is we have an opportunity. We actually want to sow into uh, Jerry Safeld Ministries International. And uh, just so you know, if you, uh, you, you'll see some envelopes that are already available for you in, front of the, in the seat in front of you. Uh, but all the proceeds are actually staying in Canada. Uh, there's a Jerry Savelle Ministries Canada. And I don't know if you know, familiar with Jerry Savelle Ministries, but they do a lot of, of course, missions, and they do a lot of things even within Canada. They have an office in Ontario. And uh, they've come, and they've been a blessing to us personally. They've been a blessing to us as a church. And so what we have an opportunity to sow into that ministry yet again as well. And I want to just give you one verse in uh, Proverbs 11, 24, 25, in the Message Bible. It says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a, we have an opportunity for our money to go international. And what I mean by that is you have an opportunity for not only our world to expound, but our money is a pavement for it to go that way. And we can do that by our tie or by our offerings this, this evening. And so what we want to do is we want to sow into Jerry Savelle Ministries. We want to be a blessing. I know for us as a church, we want to be a blessing because we want to see the gospel go across this planet, specifically across our nation in a powerful way. And what better opportunity but to partner with ministries that are able to do that and go in some churches. And, you know, uh, they're actually in a couple of Indian reservations as well, too. Just powerful to hear how the gospel is going forth and bringing a lot of those people coming into the kingdom, it's profound. And you'll hear a lot of that from their ministry as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to sow into that because we want to see this gospel go forward. Amen. That's who we are, that we're, we're blessed. We're blessed to be a blessing. So let's, we're going to pray over our offering this evening. And then, of course, ushers, thank you so much for receiving that. And we'll get all of that to Jerry Savelle Ministries. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to hear your word about the blessing. Father, we thank you, just like what Dr. Savelle said, we are not just hearers of this word, but we are active doers of this word. And we thank you right now as we intentionally sow into this ground of Jerry Savelle Ministries. Lord, we thank you that it will produce in this nation opportunities for the gospel to go forward boldly in churches, on the streets, wherever, Father, or from the north to the south to the east and west. We thank you, Father. We sow on purpose knowing that, Jesus, Lord, you are able to do what you want to do in this nation. We give you all the glory, and we just call the church to rise up boldly in our nation. We thank you for laborers to go boldly into our nation, coast to coast, to preach the uncompromised word of God and the blessing of the Lord and what it's able to do in our lives. We thank you for, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You may go ahead and receive the offering. Uh, 